one does not simply walk into Mordor. The Land of Shadow. Welcome back, everyone. In today's Shadowcast, we will be exploring Sauron's most terrible servants, the Black Riders, the Nine, the Ring Wraiths of the Dark Lord, called simply the Nazgul. They were nine mortal men doomed to die. Each was given a ring of power and so fell into the shadow. They were ensnared by the power of the One. Fear was ever their greatest weapon. So, if you guys are ready, let's go ahead and discover the secrets of the Ring Wraiths as we follow them into the shadow. In today's lore video, we will be exploring the dark history of the Nazgul. Let's begin with the forging of the Great Rings in the second millennium of the Second Age. Sauron deceived the elves of Eregion in the guise of Anatar, the giver of gifts. Celebrimbor, grandson of Feanor, who wrought both the Palantri and the Three Cimmerils, is said to have inherited the gifts of his grandfather's craft. Under the guidance of Sauron, they forged the great rings of power, nine of which were gifted to the race of men. All of the rings of power except the three elven rings were corrupted by the creation of the one ring in the fires of Mount Doom. When Sauron attacked and destroyed Eregion, his orcs ransacked the house of Myrdane, and the Nine, the Seven, and the Lesser Rings were all captured by Sauron. The Seven were gifted to the Dwarven Lords, who used them to acquire vast hordes of wealth, and yet they remained free of the power of the Dark Lord. The Nine Rings, gifted to the race of men, gave them enormous power and long life, amassing wealth and influence. They became great kings of men, mighty sorcerers and ruthless warriors. But in the end, they all fell into the shadow and became slaves to the One. With the rings of power, these men had the ability to become invisible and their lives were extended unnaturally, until at last they walked ever in the wraith world, unseen and enslaved by the will of their master, Sauron. The Nazgul would become his most deadly servants and they were terrible to behold. Little is known of these kings of men and their fall into the shadow during the Second Age, but after the defeat of Sauron during the Battle of the Last Alliance, it is said they faded into the shadows and were not seen again in Middle-earth for over a thousand years, until the second millennium of the Third Age. So who were these kings of men? In Tolkien canon, there is little to be found. We know that the Lord of the Nazgul was named the Witch King of Angmar in the north, and his second in command was named Kamul, a Lord of the Easterlings, the only Nazgul given his mannish name. It is written also that three of the Nazgul were Numenorians. That is all we know for certain. However, in the expanded mythology of Middle-earth, each of the nine are given names and histories. This is what we have found. The Witch King of Angmar was said to have been a black Numenorean, in origin a prince of the royal house of Numenor in the Second Age. The Witch King was seduced by the power of the Nine Rings 
and fell thrall to Sauron as the price paid for that terrible gift. The Witch King became the greatest of the Nazgul and second only in power to the Dark Lord himself. Kamul the Easterling, a man of rune. The Nazgul Lieutenant, emissary to the peoples of the East and the Varags. He was Lieutenant to the Witch King and second among the Nine. A potent mage in his own lifetime, now bound to the calls of Mordor forever. Kamul's origins are veiled in mystery, save that he was one of the races from beyond Rune in the furthest east of Middle-earth. Akurul, a black Numenorian. Like the Witch King, Akurul was of old a lord of Numenor, who was corrupted and ensnared by one of the Nine Rings of Power. After Sauron's fall at the end of the Second Age, a curl disappeared from Middle Earth. He returned after long years and awaited his master's return in the far south of Middle Earth. Adunafel the Quiet was a man of Eriador. After the Great Plague ravaged Eriador in the mid Third Age, Gondor's watch on Mordor became less vigilant and Sauron sent. Aduna fell to the Black Land to prepare for his eventual return. Aduna fell dwelt secretly in Nern until the arrival of the Witch King, whose coming heralded the Nazgul's assault on the Tower of Minas Ithil. Its fall signified the end of Gondor's hold on Mordor. Dwarvoa was a man of Umbar. War of War came from the seafaring race of men, whose pirate ships plundered and waged war upon the lands along the coast of Middle-earth. Known as a great warrior in the south, he was a tyrant and a king to his people, a black captain of the Corsairs of Umbar, and one of the first to fall under the spell of the Dark Lord. He gained Sauron's favor by bringing the lands of Harad under his rule through trickery and cunning and wars upon the men of Numenor. G. Endur, Dawn Death, was a man of Harad. Endur Dawn Death was born in the Second Age in the far south of Middle-earth, where he ruled a tropical kingdom despite the growing threat of Numenorean power. After being ousted from his throne, he fled to Mumakan and sought refuge with the agents of the Dark Lord, who resided there. Here he was offered one of the Nine Rings of Sauron and all of its accompanying power. Utha the Horseman was a man of Khand. Originally a Varag from Khand, Utha was, like all of his people, a great horseman. He fought in the civil wars in his native land of Khand and eventually united all the tribes under his own rule. He accepted the gift of the Ring of Power shortly after achieving this. The Varags were useful allies to the Dark Lord, protecting his eastern and southeastern borders and later proved a valuable addition to the armies of Mordor. Their fearsome and bloodthirsty reputation alone striking terror into the hearts of many of their enemies. Ren the Unclean was a man of the Brown Lands. He was said to have pronounced a curse upon Sauron before he succumbed to the power of the Ring. It is believed that he was a princeling and son of the king to the people who once lived in the lands below Greenwood the Great. This small kingdom of men lay along the eastern edge of the great river Anduin, and their southern border was the Emmanuel. The Dark Lord's wars ravaged their lands and all of its people are now gone, 
because of the greed of King Ren. None now remember their name. This forsaken place is now known as the Brownlands. Poor Murath of Dur was a man of Rune. He was born of the race of Rune in the east of Middle-earth. Much like Kamul, the Easterling, his origins are veiled in mystery. He is believed to have lived upon the Sea of Rune near its northern shores, whose people were often apt to evil. They waged wars with the men of the Long Lake, the elves of the northern wood, and the dwarves of the mountains. He is thought to have received the last of the Nine Rings, and so was one of the last to fall into shadow. During the latter years of the Third Age, it is believed Sauron reclaimed the Nine Rings unto himself extending the power of the ring race and ensuring their enslavement to the one ring. The nine Nazgul practiced the arts of dark magic, which became known as Morgul sorcery, named after the evil veil that housed the city of the wraiths in Minas Morgul. Little is known of the ancient sorcery of Mordor within the Tolkien canon. What we do know is that three of the Nazgul were supposedly black Numenorians who practiced the craft of dark sorcery. The nine together reached the height of this craft in the latter years of the Third Age, creating poison darts, morgul knives, and long swords that dripped fire and were imbued with dark magic. Sauron was a Maya of great power, and all his works were infused with the malice of his will. Great war machines, such as Grand, were etched with Morgul spells to increase their power and strike fear into their enemies. There is no doubt that the Dark Lord extended this mastery of dark magic into his most deadly servants, through the power of the rings. It is said that fear was ever their greatest weapon. They exuded a dreadful menace, evoking terror in their enemies. Their mere presence could paralyze the weak and strike horror in even the strongest warrior. They exhaled a deadly darkness called the black breath that would freeze the mind and damage the soul, causing their victims to slip away into death. This power likely came from their presence in the shadow, for they walked in the void, the wraith world, which stood in direct opposition to the light of Eru Ilvatar. Sauron's creation of the One Ring unlocked that terrible power, of this unseen world and its ability to control and devastate our own. The Nazgul were Sauron's greatest triumph in his attempt to master the world of shadow and draw its power into Middle-earth. It was during the Third Age that the Nazgul proved to be Sauron's greatest servants. In the year 1050, the Dark Lord returned in the form of a great shadow known as the Necromancer. He occupied the ruins of Amenlanc in Greenwood the Great, the ancient dwelling of the Sylvan Elves, and made of it a fortress of darkness. Evil things began to multiply once more, and the forest became known as Mirkwood. In the year 1300, the lord of the Nazgul gathered evil men and orcs, founding the kingdom of Angmar. From there he led Sauron's forces against the north kingdom of Arnor. 
To the south, Gondor was weakened by war and the coming of the Great Plague. The watch on Mordor was abandoned. It is believed that the Nazgul re-entered Mordor at the end of the second millennium of the Third Age. After the fall of the North Kingdom, the Witch King was finally defeated at Fornost, and he returned to Mordor, gathered the other Nazgul, and prepared the way for their master's return. In the year 2000, armies of orcs crossed over the mountains and captured Minas Ithil after a two-year siege. The Nazgul made the city their stronghold, and it was ever after known as Minas Morgul, the Tower of Sorcery. The Palantir from the Tower of the Rising Moon was captured and carried off to Badr Dur. In 2063, Gandalf entered Dol Gadur, and the necromancer was revealed to be Sauron, and he fled into the east. During the watchful peace, Sauron evaded the power of the White Council, and the Nazgul remained hidden in the Morgul Vale. In secret, they began to fortify the borders of Mordor. In 2064, the year the ring was found by Smeagol, Sauron returned to Dol Gadur, and darkness grew over southern Mirkwood. When Sauron was finally driven from the Hill of Sorcery, he returned to Mordor in triumph and openly declared himself. Decades later, three of the Nazgul were sent to Dol Gadur to rebuild the fortress. The dwarves of Erebor spoke of a rider who came in the night. A messenger from Mordor asking about hobbits. As a false token of friendship, Sauron asked for a ring, a trifle, the least of rings, that the thief had stolen. This messenger may have been one of the Nazgul. In 3017, Sauron commanded his ringwraiths to ride into the west of Middle-earth to find the halfling in a land with the uncouth name of Shire. Disguised as riders in black, they hunted for Baggins, who had the one ring in his possession. The Nazgul came to the very doorstep of Bag End, but too late. They hunted four hobbits across the Shire until they caught them under the shadow of Weathertop. And there the lord of the Nazgul pierced the ring-bearer with a morgul blade to make of him a wraith and a slave. The black riders failed in their attempt to regain the ring, foundering in the rising waters at the ford of Brunin. The Nazgul returned to Mordor, where they once more took shape. Sauron had bred foul beasts of the air as steeds for the Nazgul. These fell beasts were winged creatures with beak and claws, similar to birds but much larger than any other flying beast. They possessed a naked body without feathers, a long neck, and a vast pinioned hide between its horned fingers. Some have described the fell beast as a descendant of the great worms of the north, or perhaps some evil creature of a forgotten age. These winged monsters would rip open and rend their enemies and feast upon the dead. It was said that a terrible stench emanated from these foul creatures. After the Nazgul were unhorsed, Sauron gave to them fell beasts, but kept them hidden until his final assault on Minas Tirith. Then he unleashed his Nazgul on the air, filling the skies with terror. During the Battle of the Pelennor, Sauron used them as messengers to report on the progress of his assault. In battle, they could descend out of the black clouds, shooting poison darts and spreading the black breath. Wherever they struck, 
the armies of the West were overwhelmed and unmanned. In the final assault on Minas Tirith, the witch king rode forth and drove Grand against the gate, breaking wood and steel with morgul spells. The witch king was finally destroyed by the hand of a halfling and the sword of a shield maiden of Rohan, fulfilling the prophecy of Glorfindel. The eight remaining Nazgul were held in abeyance until the Battle of the Black Gate. At Sauron's command, they came forth filling the skies over the Moranon, but they were met in kind by the great eagles of the north. When Frodo put on the one ring amid the fires of Simeth Nuor, the devices of Sauron's enemies were laid bare. With all speed, the Nazgul were called to Mount Doom, but it was already too late. The one ring had been cast into the fiery chasm from whence it came, and it was destroyed. The mountain of Orodrum erupted and the Nazgul were caught in its fiery ruin. They flew into the fire, burst into flame, withered and went out, for the fate of the Nazgul was tied to that of their master. When Sauron perished, so did all of his works, including his most deadly servants, the Nazgul. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this extensive lore video about the nine mortal men who fell into the shadow. Um, in my next shadow cast, I'm going to be featuring the first of my lore videos about the brazen beasts of Middle-earth, a whole section we have devoted on the land of shadow.com. So I'm excited about bringing this into uh, the videos here in the land of shadow. Uh, so until next time, I hope to find you slogging through the dreary waters of the dead marshes where tiny candles burn for the lifeless corpses from battles past. <laughs>